Welcome to Changing the Sales Game on webtalkradio.net. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. As always, thanks for joining us this week. So I know that um, the word sales, right? It's that icky, sleazy, manipulation kind of vibe to it. And I totally get it. So here's the deal. I have a free gift for you to help you on your journey of changing that mindset of the ick factor, really to coming from this place of love, care, and respect. So go to WhitmanAssos.com slash CSA and get your free communication style assessment. You get a report that shows your natural superpowers on how people perceive you. And the flip side, you get a report showing your lowest style, which is typically our blind spots. So I hope that helps you shift that mindset So you always come from a place of love, care, and respect every time you're talking, let's just say with other humans in the world. Now, my motivational quote today is by Mark Victor. And Mark says, the magnet principle says like attracts like. You'll attract to you the people, circumstances, events, money, and resources you need to accomplish your goals. Now, being in business is not, let me tell you, it's just not for the faint of heart. The amount of noise in the marketplace, I find absolutely daunting. And finding where you fit in, in business, can truly be a challenge. Now, I believe that if you choose to do what everyone else is doing, well, you're likely to get the same results, not always good. So the big question here is, are those results the results you are personally and or professionally looking to achieve? So what's the key ingredient in standing out and shining your specific light? Be yourself, right? Only you can do that. And you deserve to attract a following of loyal customers who are fanatical about you and your business. So today I have an amazing guest, Jim Lee. um, And Jim and I are going to talk or we're going to discuss how he made a leap from traditional sales and financial services, my brother from another mother, (laughs) to becoming radically successful in an unconventional niche. Now, Jim is an award-winning futurist and investment strategist. He is the founder of StratFi and the author of Foresight Investing, a complete guide to finding your next great trade. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time and being on the show. And um, this is important stuff we're talking about. Yeah, and, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation too. I'm resonating with your message already, so... Yeah. yeah, it's so funny. When I write the intros, I try always try to find that quote kind of sets the stage. And then I build my introduction off of what my guests send me as well as the quote, right, to get us in that zone of thinking um, before the conversation even begins. So first question um, is, were you ever a hook? And can you define that for us? I think I was a hook without even knowing it. Okay, so... Um, the idea of being a hook is when you when you need to find your customers, you hunt them down, you catch them, and then you kind of drag them in, okay? And I started in the early 1990s working for a national planning firm, and we did 1990s-style financial planning using 1980s-style marketing, mm. uh, which involved making a lot of calls, talking to a lot of people. Uh, really playing the numbers game where you have this funnel where you reach a broad audience and then you narrow that audience down and then you follow through till eventually you quote unquote make the close. And um, I I think what's happened is, is we've gone from a very transactional model of advice Mm -hmm. to more of a relationship driven model of Mm -hmm. advice, which is really where you want to go. But again, back in the 1990s, we did, you know, financial planning by the pound. We were in the business of sales, of selling books of financial plans. And these were these binders that were 300 pages long that would cover everything. And um, it was kind of exhausting, to be honest, (laughs) which is why I burned out and stopped doing that because I was spinning my wheels, wasting a lot of time talking to people who didn't necessarily want to talk to me and saying the same things over and over again. Um, At at the time, the training that we received, and and it was considered good, again, at the time, um, was to go through a very structured process with our clients. Uh, We were uh, taught a 40-minute interview script word for word 
And maybe that was good if you're just coming out of college and you don't know sure. how to talk to people. Sure. But you grow out of that and you move beyond that and you need to do something else at some point. You know, so a couple of comments on that. Um, yes, for somebody just starting out, that type of structure is good because they don't always know, right? Young, when I, I, I know when I was younger, right? I had no, I had no network. I didn't know anybody, right? I didn't know how to talk about sales. I didn't even know what sales was, right? Coming out of college, so I, I do, I do agree with that. Now it's funny because you mentioned the word really you want to be building relationships. So I remember when I started in financial sales as well. They gave us these scripts, and I'll just share a funny story. So the first day, it was Prudential is who I worked for, mm -hmm. and they gave us a script. Now, we're, this is back in the 80s, early 80s, and they gave us a phone book, and they said, you know what? Here's a script. Go make these phone calls. So I'm well, a dude. I, I follow the rules, right? Mm -hmm. I went through, and the script was because we would, we'd make phone calls at night, and it was like, good evening. Now, see, I can't even say good evening without sa sounding like I'm a vampire, right? I'm right. going to suck your blood. So- I was 20 something years old. Good evening. Like, it's just not even how I spoke. So I remember the first day it was all commission, right? There was no salary. Mm -hmm. I quit a job with a salary, take this job. I'm thinking I have a personality. I'm smart. I've got all my licenses. This is going to be easy. Not right. So I, I'm an epic fail that first night. And I remember I went home and I was living with my parents. Thank God at the time I had a car okay. payment. That was it. Yeah. Amen. Right. Amen. <laughs> for having no bills. Boy, I wish I could go back. But anyway, the, um, I remember lying in bed that night thinking, what have I, like, what have I done? Like you crazy person, you left this perfectly good job. And now how are you going to make money? And I realized during the night that their script, it wasn't me. It didn't feel right. It was super uncomfortable. So I went in the next day and I outlined the point that they were trying to make with, you know, this is Connie from uh, Prudential. Good evening. It was an introduction, right? Well, I just don't talk that way. So my introduction, you know, 40 years later is how you doing? It's still how you doing. So I would get on the phone and I would say, hi, this is Connie from Prudential. How you doing? And it, so I edited their script and I have never in all of my years training, you know, 20 years in business, Jim, I have never, ever, ever allowed anyone to use a script because you can't talk the way I speak and I can't speak the way you speak. It, it sets us up for failure. The other thing, it keeps us in exactly what you said before. It keeps us from creating dynamic relationships and for us to truly get to know who that client is and how I could potentially help them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to be you. And um, sometimes structure can get in the way of that, but sometimes structure prevents you from getting in your own way. Right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. You've got to be you. Balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, so how do you, f let me, all right. So how are you different now other than what you've already shared with us? And what do you think, um, and what do you think the advantages are now with, with how you just kind of do business? Sure. Yeah. So at this point, it's pretty much inbound marketing for me in that I am not in a position, thankfully, where I have to make, you know, 70 phone calls, 100 phone calls a week. I don't focus on finding the right client, the right customer. I make it easy for them to find me. So in essence, people self-select when they work with me. I mean, my marketing these days is mostly answering the phone and doing things that are interesting so that other people end up talking about me more, okay? Love it. So uh, yeah, the old days, um, you know, old sales training in the 1990s was asking for referrals. Again, that hook, you know, nobody wants to be hooked. Nobody wants to be dragged around. These days, I don't ask. It just comes in and it's, it's a much better place to be in. Yeah, it feels better. It's easier. Everybody wins, right? It's about building relationships. And everybody talks about that, but they say build relationships. No one tells you how to actually build that relationship. So what are the disadvantages and advantages of being this magnet versus the hook, right? That's that's really sure, what we're talking sure. about. So, so yeah, let's, let's talk about what, what being a magnet is, okay? Yeah. And being a magnet is being someone and doing things that attract people to you. And being a hook, again, is, is sort of dragging them in. And 
Um, I've, I've done both. I mean, I started out and was sort of semi-successful for the first, you know, six or seven years of my career, um, doing it the old way, the conventional way, but it was exhausting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Agree. Um, and then in the last 10 years after starting my own firm and, you know, being my own person, I, I learned how to do the things that make me happy, which in turn makes the people around me happy. And that's a much... Mm -hmm better way to go. So um, the, the, the drawback, as you mentioned, though, is that um, things don't happen as quickly, necessarily. It's harder to start from scratch when you're a magnet, because you might not necessarily have the visibility or the momentum yeah. for people to find you. Okay. Yeah. And that is the biggest drawback is that it does take longer. Um, it takes longer to get people to come on board. Sometimes I'll know people for 10 or 15 years yeah. where they send that email or they'll make that call or whatever. But it also makes those relationships stay around longer too. Okay. Yeah. So retention goes through the roof and that's, that's a big plus. And um, it's just a better way of doing things if you can do it. You know, I, I know there are some sales and I'm doing air quotes for those listening on, on Apple uh, podcasts and not watching the YouTube, but um, there, you know, there's some uh, thought, thought leaders out there in sales um, that believe that if you don't have like a 25% refund ratio where people ask for a refund, you're doing it wrong. And, and when I hear stuff like that, one of my clients, she was in a program like that. And when she said that, I said, what did you say? And, and 20, now that I, sounds really high to me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that That's sounds crazy. Like, if I have to refund 25% of my customers, then, then I'm doing something wrong. You know. That's what I thought. And I thought, wait, did you get the percentage wrong? I thought maybe 5%, right? Because people, yeah. things change sometimes with, with nobody's fault, right? And she says, nope, they told me if I don't have a 25% refund ratio, I'm doing it wrong. I'm not pushing hard enough. And that's where I thought, ah, wow. the word pushing is, is the problem. Pushing and within the problem. Yeah. 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 And, and for me, if I get one refund, I'm crying. What did I do wrong? Were I they know. not the right person? Right. Did I not service well, them? Yeah. I mean, the key here <laughs> is almost anticipating problems before they become problems. Of course. Okay? Of course. And in knowing when to say no, because we are so busy sometimes trying to impress, trying to you know, get other people to like us that sometimes we end up working with unlikable people. <laughs> That's a problem. Which is not fun. And, and that is not going to work either. So remember when you meet with someone, when you meet with a prospect or whatever, it is in fact a two-way interview, okay? That's right. And they are screening you, but you are screening them as well. Absolutely. And if there's anything going on in the back of your head saying, hey, this is not going to work, you need to pay attention to that. I agree because yeah. you know that that's self-protection going on right there yeah so talk to me about how how have you made yourself a magnet what are some of the strategies that you've used to do that attraction um, versus the hook perspective because I love that magnet versus yeah. hook I love that visual mm -hmm. so what have you done uh, strategically to be able to build that because it does take time right because it's not transactional yeah. it does right. take time for people mm -hmm. to like no trust us right so how did you do that what are some of the strategies yeah. so, so this really goes back to um, what you led with and that's the idea that if you keep doing what everyone else is doing you're going to get the same results yeah okay. and you're also not going to stand out because you're going to look like everyone else and you're going to be sort of interchangeable with everyone else at that point too. Um, so, so where I started a, a niche was to figure out what I really enjoyed doing and that's to, to figure out what happens next. And I took an unconventional career route, mid-career, uh, when it was time to get a graduate degree, I had a choice between getting an MBA which sounded like a completely rational thing to do, or becoming a professional futurist, which was a little wacky, but a lot of fun. And um, given normal versus fun, I will tend towards fun. Okay? 
And I found uh, there, there is one degree program in the United States that will teach you how to become a futurist and do forecasting and scenarios and look at you know black swans and all of these things. And it's in Texas. Um, my wife at the time was applying for her graduate school mm. in medicine, her fellowship, and that happened to be in the same city as my graduate school was in. Wonderful. And um, I found this tribe, this global tribe of really fascinating people that are interested in creating a better future. And uh, that was um, my niche was even to this day, I'm Delaware's only professional futurist. And by being a little bit different, people are gonna ask questions, but you also have the benefit of having a different angle, a different approach to what you do. Okay, so, so my take is the view is always better from the edge, whether it's a geographic edge, whether it's a social edge, whether it's an interdisciplinary edge, so uh, I sort of live at this boundary between foresight and finance, and I apply that to my work. So, so that's, yeah, that's my niche. And, and how do you do your outreach to attract those right clients? Like, that's wonderful, right? What you just described is awesome. So how do people find you versus you seeking, right? Yeah, so um, I like to write and I do a fair amount of speaking as well. Yeah. And people are always looking for speakers and they're always looking for material. Okay. So I would say my best marketing right now is uh, my own newsletter, uh, which I put out on constant contact. It's just a once, once a month kind of thing. It's all original content. I don't use anything that I found anywhere else. Uh, it's a little wacky, okay, because I, I kind of realized a while ago that if I don't find something interesting, chances are nobody else is going to find it interesting either. Yep. So I only became successful when I stopped trying to be normal, okay? <laughs> and once I went a little bit over the edge, people started to pay attention to me. So, you know, I love it. Right, things about pot stocks and fake meat and, you know, techie things that no one's ever heard about cryptocurrency and I started covering sort of wacky investment ideas from the perspective of a you know financial analyst and all of that and uh, what happened was instead of <laughs> reaching you know 500 or a thousand people in my newsletter it would get picked up by local media outlets and it would go out to 30 or 40,000 people instead. That's great. So, so, you know, that message got amplified hugely. And then when people started looking for a futurist or someone, you know, talking about what's coming up, they started reaching out to me and, you know, asking if I can do a talk on cryptocurrency or anti-aging technology or, or whatever. And um, that's how I, I built my reputation. That's amazing. How did you find those media outlets? I know everybody's thinking, all right, how did he do that? How did you get amplified to the 30,000 versus your couple of hundred, you know, or, or a thousand on your email list? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so a, a lot of that was local networking and uh, just meeting people locally. I mean, Delaware, you know, the, the joke is most places have six degrees of separation, but in Delaware, you only have two. <laughs> meaning that you're just one step away from knowing pretty much everyone else in the state. So I think there's an advantage there. That's uh, funny. Yeah. The, the other resource that I found, um, which is really quite powerful, uh, it's an online service called Quoted, Q-W-O-T-E-D. And it's, it's basically a dating service for reporters. So what they will do is they will tell you what they're looking for in terms of the articles that they're working on. I love it. And you type your answers back in. And if they like your answers, they'll either quote you directly based on those answers. So they'll follow up with you. But um, I've gotten coverage from fairly surprising places for you know, relatively little effort. Uh, you know, things I, I won't mention the services, but yeah, I've gotten national coverage through that and international coverage as well. It's awesome. 
That's awesome. You know, these resources are out there and that's the problem, Jim. We, you know, business owners don't, we don't know what we don't know. What, like I started with, when we communicate, we have blind spots. If you, if no one ever shines a light on the blind spot, how can you address it and fix it, right? Or find a solution because you don't even know it's there. So sometimes we're shooting ourselves in the foot and we don't even know we're doing that, right? So uh, what a great resource. Uh, is it only for finance, the Q-W-O-T-D? Did I say that right? Uh, quoted, T-D, yeah. Um, no, it's for everyone. I mean, Love anyone can, can use this. Now, cool. if you work at a traditional wirehouse, they have a lot of limitations in terms of what you can say or sending things through compliance departments and, and yes. these sorts of things. Yes. So there are a lot of controls that make it harder to really be yourself. Yeah. If you are in a larger organization and it's, it's, hard to get around that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Compliance, legal, it, you know, we need, we need that stuff, right? Need it. But yeah, it I mean, does. It's the best protection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's funny. My, my husband and I, we just finished um, on Hulu dope sick. I think it was called Michael Keaton was in, it was great. It was about um, uh, Purdue pharma and it was about mm -hmm. Oxycontin mm -hmm. and how in the nineties, it created an epidemic of, you know, people couldn't eventually get the, the, the oxy. So they would go to heroin. And that's why we have such a big issue now. And right. we finished it. And I, I said to my husband, cause remember I'm, I'm in sales, right? You're in sales. Mm -hmm. And I was so offended and any, everybody listening, you really should watch it. I think everybody should understand what happened and how we have to keep organizations from teaching their salespeople to be so darn unethical. And the sad thing is most of the sales reps didn't even know they were being unethical because they were sharing information about medical stuff that seemed very logical. It was all manipulated data and, and information. And, and I was angry at the end of watching this because I thought they took no responsibility. They got, I think they got fined $6 billion or something, which they made, you know, six bajill bajillion dollars. So it, it's, um, sales gets a bad rap, Jim, because of, of, of stuff like that. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. I love how you approach it from that magnet hook so that we're not aggressively pursuing um, buy from me, buy from me and me making, you know, a ton of money, but I'm killing people on the other end. It's, it's, that whole story is tragic, but it's a much what must, must watch. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that actually sort of brings up the question of external versus internal or intrinsic motivation. Yeah. And that, um, again, when I was starting out, you have sort of your sales manager and that you want to make them happy sure, and reach your numbers and do things to make someone happy that doesn't necessarily make you happy. Absolutely. And, and sometimes when you have your own firm and you're just really trying to do it for you and for your client, Absolutely. It's just a much simpler equation to, to balance out. Yeah, agree. I remember my sales manager, um, I was there probably about two years. Again, you know, you're a kid and trying to please everybody and do everything right and please your clients and you're learning, right? It's just such a struggle. Right, right, and I remember right. I had met with a business owner and had a family and he needed a million dollar policy. Now this is back in the eighties, right? So I come in the next day and you know, I'm like on the moon, I sold a million dollar life policy and it was what the guy needed, right? You know, it was a referral and yeah, um, it was a, hopefully it, it was, it was a good yeah. match, right? It wasn't like I sold something I shouldn't. And I came in, I was so excited. And I went into my manager and I said, so my first million dollar policy. And he looked at me and he goes, why wasn't it 2 million? I was like, oh my God, talk about popping the balloon, right? It was like, are you kidding no, me? Yeah, I, I didn't last much longer in that firm and yeah, yeah, moved yeah. on. But yeah, that's exactly but, what you're talking about. But but there's there also the other thing too, right? So everything is sort of two-sided and that is that sometimes if you don't have you know, a sales manager or a boss, you don't know if you're really doing a good job or not. You don't have that external validation. That's true. That's true. And you don't know your own blind spots, which is why you need to work with a coach or you need to have you know, a, a, a group so that you can have other people reflect you back at you and Absolutely. you get to see whether you like what you're seeing or not. Yeah. Yeah. I have two coaches right now. And that's another thing I tell people, if you're a coach and you don't have a coach, it doesn't have to be me per se, but if mm -hmm. you're a coach and you don't have a coach, very dangerous because you have blind spots that you're not even aware of 
because you know you're you have a blind spot so uh yeah coaches should have coaches as well because we do have blind spots i know you talk about talking less can you explain what you mean by that yeah it's it's about listening because people will tell you what they want and they'll just tell you okay and you it's need true. to tune into that so that you can make people happy and people do need to be listened if someone's calling you excuse me there we go lighting check um, <laughs> someone's Tech calling, issue. You, calling you with an issue or concern don't don't interrupt let them speak let them be heard yeah. sometimes that's really the message yeah i love it and and people need to be heard especially with you with the the financial stuff money, people worry about money. So if you're not allowing them to tell you their fears, right, their, their um, uh, security issues, whatever it is, you really can't tap into and, and help them create a plan that puts all of that angst to ease. If you don't understand right. the angst, how can you, how can you talk to that, right? That's really going to be too emotionally hard to deal with. Sure. Unless they get this off their chest. And, and, you know, let's face it, you're there to solve their problems and they need to tell you what their problems are. That's right. That's right. Uh, let's shift for a minute. Talk about your book, uh, Foresight Investing, A Complete Guide to Finding Your Next oh, Great Trade. Yeah. Why write the book and what give, give some context because I, yay, uh, yes, beautiful. Yes. I'd love for people to buy it. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, so, so this was the investment book that I always wanted. It simply didn't exist at the time. Sure. And um, after I became a financial advisor, I spent 15 years in postgraduate education, you know, just getting all the alphabet soup behind my name, you know, yeah. CFP, CFA, you know, all of that. And um, what I was looking for was something a little bit more advanced than you know finance for dummies right yeah but something that didn't lapse into greek okay when you get into academic finance they will lapse into greek and roll out all of these equations you know, talk about alpha data you know betas deltas and they you know it, it gets very confusing very quickly mm. i wanted something right in between and something that used all of the skill sets that i've developed over the years as a futurist, as a financial analyst, as someone who looks at trends to create a single source that can tell you how to build your portfolio from top to bottom. I love it. And um, that's what this book is about. And when, when COVID came around, um, it gave me the time and the space to do it. You know, people yeah. ask, how, how did you, have, you know, find time to write a book? And I'm like, oh, COVID, quarantine. Yep, all the time in the world. Yeah, we got the book out. <laughs> We make good choices. <laughs> yeah. no, me too. I, it's so funny when I speak, Jim, I say that I go, so COVID hit. So what do you do? You write a book. You know? yeah, it was like there's nothing else to do. Yeah, it made sense. Here's the thing though, right? Everything happens for a reason. And I do believe, listen, COVID was horrifying, scary. We lost so many loved ones. Um, you know, people are still having issues, bronchial issues and stuff like that. It's real. Right. On the flip side, though, right, if as a business owner, we use that time super wisely. Um, so that was good because we're able to create our I'm going to use the word masterpiece. I don't know that it's necessarily right. a masterpiece, but for us, right. it's our masterpiece. But it's a resource that's needed in the marketplace. And, and COVID allowed us the opportunity to create, which is was wonderful. Uh, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity to seize. It, right. It did. And, and there was a moment there where we didn't know if the wheels would fall off the wagon. We didn't exactly know right. what would happen. And, right. and um, I ended up having two of my best years ever, um, which was kind of amazing. And I had this realization that if you have a niche, then geography doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. And, and really anyone in the world can become your client now. Yeah. And more so now than ever, ever before. 
Yeah, that was the other big, uh, I think, shift for business owners, really for anybody. Um, we, we stay in contact. Zoom and Zoom just gets better and better and better. Mm -hmm. um, they're constantly adding and refining and bandwidth and all of these things. So it really it's an easier time, I think, to be in business. You know, than when I started my business 21 years ago, it was it was just a different time. So, yeah, there's. The opportunities are there. Again, if you have those blind spots, that's why I love doing the show. Like the, the Q, QW, say it one more time for me. QW, Quoted. With Quoted. Q-W-O-T-E-D. T-E-D. Mm -hmm. um, love that. Yeah, another resource. So as people hear things like that, you as a futurist, right? What does that mean? You have a book. Let me read that book. How can that help me? We have blind spots and we don't know there are blind spots till you read a book or till you hear Jim say, right, quoted or futurist, or, right? So the, these are, this is why I love doing the show because we share great content to help people move the needle on whatever's going on in their life, their business, their career, um, et cetera. Um, guys, we're out of time, but I do want to share. Uh, Jim, please, please, if you have a question, email Jim. It's J Lee, L E E, at stratfi s-t-r-a-t-f-i.com that's his email and of course the website is stratfi.com i will put that in the show notes you don't have to go looking for it um but reach out buy the book you know see if jim can help you with your financial uh just creating more financial strength because we we are in unprecedented times between covid what's going on with ukraine um our economy inflation you know the the inform the the um the world keeps changing are we insulating our financial portfolios so that we can shift and pivot as needed, just as we do in life? So maybe Jim is the answer to your prayer. So I, I really I, I recommend reaching out to him. I totally recommend buying the book because it's um, everybody doesn't know about money and finance. So this, I think, is a nice approach, Jim, right? What you've written so that it's not it's not, again, finance for dummies, but it's not those algorithms and betas and thetas and how to look at, you know, the, the back end of a business to see if it's profitable to buy the stock. And, you know, we don't need that complexity of knowledge. Um, so I love that you created something kind of in the middle. That's just wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for being on and sharing your zone of genius. It's always a pleasure hanging with you. I love your calm demeanor. For me, it's uh, it's soothing, believe it or not. You know, and everybody's laughing now because they're like, yeah, Connie doesn't have a calm demeanor. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks thanks so much for being on it's always a pleasure uh seeing you jim thank you thank you yeah real joy and i hope you will join me weekly as we question build and discover together that being heart-centered in business it's okay it's the way you should be and i really hope that between my guests and i our stories our tips our books our strategies help you make that shift of being you instead of being what everybody else wants you to be, especially in the framework of business and career. Um, so again, I hope my resources, I hope our conversations, I hope, you know, Jim's book, all of those things help you navigate whatever's happening in your life to make you stronger and better and faster and just more productive and more profitable in your own world. So uh, Jim, thank you again. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, you've been listening to Changing the Sales Game on uh, webtalkradio.net with me, your host, Connie Whitman. I wish you all a wonderful, inspired week. And again, buy Jim's book, create that financial stability in your life. We all deserve it. We all deserve to be abundant in every aspect of our life. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Have a great one.